Okay, hello young writers. Uh, I think we're almost ready to go. So there's a live chat feature, I hope, on the right-hand side of your YouTube uh, link. Um, so any questions, just uh, sing them in the chat. We've got some student ambassadors who are going to be monitoring that, and uh, we'll say, shout out your questions as it goes. Um, Dr. Jack Underwood's going to join me now, and he's going to deliver your session. Hopefully it'll be about half an hour with questions at the end. Um, enjoy. Okay, hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Jack Underwood. I'm a senior lecturer in creative writing here at Goldsmiths. Um, I lecture on the undergraduate programs. I also teach MA students and supervise some PhDs. Um, I'm also the admissions tutor for the English creative writing um, degree program. So um, I'm quite used to reading um, stories uh, written by people at Sixth Form College and stuff like that. So I'm kind of fairly, fairly clear on, on some of the, um, the pitfalls or the, the difficulties that young writers can have at that stage. Um, so what I've devised today is a, I've basically broken down three tips and hints that I think um, are going to help you explore and write short story, stories that are perhaps more original um, or have more uh, interrogative, exploratory kind of um, aspects to them. Because I think one of the problems when writing um, short stories is that we fall into habits, we write stories that are too much like those we've already read. Or we write them that write stories that are kind of too led by plot and don't uh, really stop and consider the world or the questions that they might be asking. So um, it's that interrogative aspect of the short story that I'm interested in, in hopefully expanding for you um, a bit today. So the short story uh, form or genre is, is as old as literature, really. Um, there was a kind of modern phenomenon. It, 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 you can go back to things like sort of uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and then you've got people like Arthur Conan Doyle with the with the Sherlock Holmes stories, things like that. But but then if you take it right through to the um, the modern day, we have things like flash fiction um, and hint fiction, and um, and even some crossover with prose poetry as well. So I think nowadays the short story is really recognised as a form that's um, sort of expansive, various. Um, it, it 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 can sort of it's used as a sort of an experimental form to explore certain ideas um, and it's not beholden to the obligation that a novel would have where you have over a sustained um, word count, over a sustained period of time, you have to um, build a world that feels sort of secure um, enough for that, you know, that readerly investment. If you're going to read uh, 200 pages of a novel, you have to kind of feel like the world is real. And that kind of making something uh, real can be um, a different kind of burden um, than the one that a short story writer might experience when, they, when they're when they really just getting in and getting out again. And they can take for granted certain aspects of the world that they're creating. So the shortness of the story is, is its key kind of asset. And the stories you've been asked to write um, are just 1,000 words. That's a, that's a relatively um, short, short story. Um, so I'm also taking that into consideration when I'm uh, going to give you these hints and tips. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is this concept of length, which we're familiar with. But perhaps what you might not think about in terms of stories is width. OK, so if you can see the pen here, this is um, it's quite faint on, your, on my screen. It might, you might be able to see. You'll get the idea. It's just a line. Um, and anyway, what, what we have here, if this is the beginning of your story and it goes towards the end, and that's 1,000 words, okay? If you think about how many events, how many things are going to happen in that, in that short story, if you have just loads of events and you're busy describing all these events along the timeline of your story, if you have too many of them and you're preoccupied with moving from event to event, you'll find that by the time you've written a thousand words, you'll, you won't really have had time to stop and consider the meaning of those events. So what I'm suggesting as a tip or a hint is that within this thousand words, you choose maybe only one or two events. It's not a novel, it's not a film, it's more like one scene in a film, or two scenes in a film, or it's like two scenes in a play rather than a whole play. You don't, you don't have to um, worry too much 
about um, explaining what happens before the drama. You can just jump right in and, 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 and infer what we call the anterior action, the action that takes place before the story begins. So you can infer that anterior action, and then, you, then you're just interested in exploring the short amount of time that your story is covering. So two events, it gives you what I call width. It gives you the opportunity to sort of move your, side, your story from side to side as it progresses. So you can have digression, you can have zooming in on certain aspects, you can consider things, you can consider the impact. Characters can stop and think, huh, this chair reminds me of the chair in my childhood living room. And they might, they might take a detour into their memory, or they might consider whether the fact that somebody's crossing and uncrossing their legs is because they're nervous. Um, you can have all these kind of little small details and considerations in a short story, um, which I call wit. You can provide wit to your short story if you don't cram it full of events. If you have to have a car chase, and then they've got to go um, to the hospital, and then they wake up in a prison cell, and then they get abducted by aliens. And if you have all this stuff going on in a thousand words, and you try and have too many events, you'll find that you've basically um, run out of time to do the real work of writing, which is to explore the nature of things, which is to say, what does this mean? Why is this meaningful? Why should somebody give up time in their day to read it? Okay, so that's the first, the first um, hint I'm giving you. Plenty of width, lots of digressions. Give yourself room to explore and describe um, the world that your, that your story is taking place in. Explore the psychology of the characters. Explore the philosophical implications of the actions that they, they undertake, okay? So, one is width as well as length. The second thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is, called, is more to do with style. Um, if we've talked about plot and character and those kind of things, um, style is a much it's, it's as various as subject actually you can have stories about cats bungalows wire world chewing gum justin bieber whatever there's millions and millions infinite kinds of uh, stories uh, subjects of stories but but there's also there's, uh, lots of different ways of sort of, of telling those stories of thinking about how um, the language of your story happens is it going to be in first person is it going to be somebody talking to you about their experiences in which case, um, if it's a first-person story, the story is as much a kind of act of characterization as it is um, something that explains um, what happens to that person. If you have it in third person and you're kind of removed from the action, then you're seeing things kind of externally and you might be able to um, have more of an overview of, of how different characters feel about things. So you have multiple perspectives to kind of weigh up. Um, and that's obviously going to be a very different kind of story. And if you write too heavily, if you voice too heavily um, that kind of story, then, then you become aware of the narrator. So, so style um, relates to subject and the way that stories unfold. Um, they're, they're basically part of the same thing. So in order to help you negotiate style, um, I'm going to draw something called the power arc, which is this sort of semicircle here. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and over here, we have what I call strong words. Um, why don't we call these sturdy words? I don't want to write strong and stable. It's politically loaded at the moment. Um, strong and sturdy. So this is um, my colleague, Arda Shirvakil. He's a short story writer and novelist. He has this power arc um, in his teaching. And really, all the words that are on the strong side of things are kind of busy words. They're kind of wordy words. The, the flavor of those words is really is, is strong. It's kind of overpowering. So here we have alabaster, synamulant. We have uh, big abstract nouns like hope, um, death, blood, anything, any swear words, anything um, sort of highly technical, you might have flocky norky nihilopilification on here, you might have um, anti distinguishmentarianism you might have amethyst, you might, so sort of technical, big wordy words. Now, if all your words appear on this end of the power arc, you're in trouble, because what happens is the wordage itself 
becomes so sort of wrought that the, the reader becomes very aware of the surface of the language. The surface of the language becomes actually a distraction and impedes the reader um, being able to engage with what's happening, with what's going on. So you need to mediate any of these words on the strong end of the power arc with sturdy ones like bread or chair or hair or um, coat. Sort of sturdy, they actually tend to be uh, Anglo-Saxon nouns, um, sort of mud, spade, shovel, uh, spoon, those kind of words. And, and, and simple language, because it's actually not uh, big words that, that are sort of, that the words aren't, aren't, uh, don't contain good ideas. They just, they just refer to ideas. So if you can have, you can probably describe the same concepts um, or the same, same effects in a story with sturdy words as you can with these. And if you have too much of these, the writing just becomes like syrup, okay? Um, so I have another way of describing this. Um, and what we're describing here is overwriting, when you overstretch. Overwriting is really common. Um, and, I, and I describe it as kind of like a cheesecake. Okay? So here's our cheesecake. It's not great. I guess it has sides, isn't it, for a cheesecake? You can, you can, it can be a moussaka as well. In other classes, I choose a moussaka. But today I'm choosing a cheesecake. So I cut my cheesecake in half here. It's got a little layer of this jam or something in there. Um, and it's got this, this lovely buttery biscuit base. And then it's got its cheese filling, right? Now, the reader, if this is language, if this is your story cut in half, and the reader is trying to access the ideas, that buttery biscuit base, that intrinsic thing that gives the story its, its shape and its texture. And you've got way too much cheesecake, you've got way too much cheese element. It's actually just harder to get through it. So if, you, if you've written all the stuff on, the, on this right-hand side of the power arc and you've just got loads and loads of words, then the reader actually can't get through it. They get distracted. And you end up with this ridiculous cheesecake that this, that this, that's this high. So you need a little bit of color. You need a little bit of interest. Um, in the language, but mainly that comes to ideas. So, so make sure that you're not overwriting. Make sure that your cheesecake is nicely balanced. It's not 90% cheese um, and then this tiny little bit of biscuit at the bottom. You need to have a balance, and you need to be able to, for the reader to to get through the language. In fact, the language should should serve only to um, to direct the reader to the idea that you're assigning. Um, and, and not really be a sort of secondary decorative feature of it. Um, or, or at least when you are being decorative, not in such a way that it's distracting for a reader, because they're not interested in reading what a great writer you are, they're interested in the story. And if the story's good, then they'll think you're a good writer anyway. So don't try and sort of be too fancy, too luxurious with your writing, because most of the time it just puts people off. Most of the time it just impedes their, uh, their, their, their access to the actual events and story that's taking place. So, length, but also width, that's the first one. And the second one when it comes to style is don't overwrite, okay? That's crucial. The third thing I want to talk to you about is a real bugbear of mine, and, um, and that's from someone who has a lot of bugbears. Um, about writing, um, and that's cliché. Now, cliché is a word you've probably heard before, um, and it refers really to things that are kind of archetypical, that are so familiar to us now that they're kind of dead. They're, they're not very, they're, they've become boring through repetition. They've become over-familiar. So they, they happen on a, on a range of levels, though. So it's not one type of cliché. Um, they can happen on an individual sentence unit. So you might have something being as white as snow. When we think, when we hear that phrase, you know, uh, white as snow, we don't really think about what snow is too much. Um, it's, it's kind of so familiar to us that our brain just kind of slides down the slope of the phrase and into the bin. Whereas if we had something like, I don't know, um, like if somebody had a face like an omelette, 
that's a kind of new idea. We haven't encountered that before necessarily. And we have to think, oh, okay, what's the anomaly at place like? Um, and we do a bit of work. The reader's imagination is brought into play. They have to sort of work through that. That but it provides them with a kind of questioning language that they have to invest in. Whereas something like white as snow, or like uh, rose-colored lips, or something. Love poetry throws these all the all, all the time. Um, so little idioms. I'm trying to think of think of more. See, when you try to think of cliches, uh, it's hard to do, but they're there all, all of the time. You'll be familiar with them. Um, they're all throughout, like, um, the, the, the lyrics of, of, like, love songs and that sort of thing. Um, but they also exist on a, on, on a much larger level. So I'm drawing this kind of graph here. Okay, so on this little thing, little individual cliches, like white as snow down here, but we also have things like, let's say, mid-level cliches in terms of their size, you can have things like character. Character can be a cliche. So let's think about, like, I don't know, a situation in which there's, like, this high school jock um, and there's this cheerleader and there's this kind of slightly nerdy guy who listens to a lot of Bell and Sebastian and he's very introspective and he's bookish and he's in love with the cheerleader um, but he doesn't really stand a chance because she's only interested in this jock um, who's really arrogant and unpleasant and a bully. So you've probably encountered something like this story before. You've, you've probably uh, encountered something like the dynamics of those characters before and the way that they might interact. And if, and if, and if that's so, so familiar, then as a reader, you're less surprised, but you're less invested. You've got less work to do. So those things can be cliches as well when they're archetypes, when they're stereotypes. Um, because nobody's that simple. No character is really just a jock. Okay, you might have a big sort of hench, burly jock um, in a high school uh, movie or something, but what they don't show you is the fact that his parents' divorce has really affected him. And actually, he used to wet the bed until he was 12 years old. Um, he's really interested and fascinated by the parakeets that live in his garden. Um, and once he won a game of uh, uh, Scrabble, uh, at Christmas, and he was so uh, pleased with himself about that um, that he actually went to his bedroom and cried. That is a three-dimensional, possibly plausible, interesting, um, original character. The archetype, the stereotypical jock, is kind of dead already. We, we know them. There's no work to do. There's no interest there. So characters can also be cliches. Right at the end here, big things, we can have things like plot. So plot can also be a cliche. If your story begins with someone waking up, which a lot of stories um, that I have to read as an admissions tutor do, then it's very familiar. That happens, like we wake up every morning. So why choose that point to begin a story? It's a very, very familiar, slightly tired way to begin a story. Even if they wake up suddenly, dramatically, Try and avoid things like that. Um, or, or like the, the most classic plot uh, cliche is that you woke up and it was all a dream. Um, that kind of thing is familiar, it's boring, we've heard it before, it lacks originality. So you might also have like, okay, there's the bit where the guy's fighting the dragon and he loses his sword and he's on the ground uh, and, and, and he thinks that the dragon is about to kill him and then his friend from earlier who you thought was dead comes in and and in a, in, a, in a sort of act of profound sacrifice, uh, charges at the dragon, um, and, and, and somehow the hero gets away, gets his sword. You know, these kind of things play out with a kind of tedious predictability. We know what's going to happen, um, and, and they, they fall out kind of very unoriginally. So, so you can also have cliché in terms of plot, character, setting. You have to be quite careful about these things. Now, of course, a lot of these cliches arise out of some kind of truth, okay? Um, out of some kind of correlation in real life. People are um, interested in sport. You do have people who are kind of jock-like. Um, there are like uh, bookish, introspective people, um, and people do actually um, cheerlead. So you can't really avoid some of the material here, um, but you can avoid archetypical descriptions, archetypal drawings um, of these individuals. When things feel too much like a cartoon, that's when cliché 
is 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 ruining the story or or or, or, or limiting its potential. So don't be in t entirely paralyzed by the idea that oh this might be cliched um, to the extent where you actually can't write a story at all. But do be aware of whether you're treading a familiar um, path. In fact, treading a familiar path, that's a bit of a cliche for me to use there. So, you know, it's, it's part, part and parcel um, of saying anything. Um, but just make sure that when you do write things that are verging on archetypical, that you do so with a kind of an, with enough awareness to mediate it, to make those archetypes real, to make them new again in some way. Don't let them become sort of um, hollow cartoons. And think about plot. Should this happen? Um, does this need to happen? Or has it happened too many times in other things and it's kind of familiar? Okay, so those are the three main um, aspects or hints or tips that I'm giving you. Avoid uh, cliche, that's that one. Remember the first one was width as well as length. Don't be too ambitious with um, what you expect to get done in a thousand words in terms of plot. It's a very short amount of words. Once you're in, you, you're practically out again. So get in there and explore things, ask questions, digress, bring in memory, consider things, give yourself room to move uh, laterally and, and to bring other um, questions and ideas into play. The second thing is style. Don't overwrite, don't over embellish or luxuriate. Don't be too self-conscious about your writerliness because it, it, it'll often come off as, as trying too hard or distracting or perhaps even a little bit pretentious. So you have to be, have to be careful with that. And the third thing is avoid cliche. Be, be watchful and mindful of the fact that your story is just one of many stories and there are millions of stories that have happened beforehand. If yours is just simply retelling um, the same stories, what's it adding, what's it bringing that's new? Um, what traction is it getting um, on that whole canon that pre-exists it? So those are the three things, okay? Width as well as length, style, don't overwrite, and try and avoid cliche. Okay, now I'm ready for your questions. No, no one's got any questions? Lee, any questions? Um, Put you on the spot. Um, what's, in a, in a short story of a thousand words, yeah. Is there an optimum number of characters that you can introduce in, in that length of time? Well, that's a good question, actually. Um, I would say that there's not an optimum, because it could be uh, a short story about a choir, couldn't it? Um, or um, on a train. Um, it could be, but the point is how, when you have a lot of characters, if you want to have main characters, characters that you're going to draw, that are going to be kind of 3D individuals, that are going to have um, that are going to be involved in the story in some way. How are you going to adequately the, describe them and give them enough start, uh, enough things to do so they feel believable, so that they add something, so that they're they're not just there sort of incidentally? How are you going to make them part of the story and what happens um, if you've only got a thousand words to do it? If I was to write a, a short story about uh, of a thousand words, I'd probably only have two characters. I have some sort of interaction that raised a question that created a problem that they, uh, that through the course of their dialogue, um, something was either, was not resolved exactly, but some sort of complexity um, about human nature was brought into it within reach. I think that you could, you could have, um, you could have a story about, you know, two football teams um, in a thousand words, but the way in which you're going to be able to treat those as individuals is going to be much, you're going to be much further away from them. You're not going to be able to get inside their head in quite the same way. So there's going to be a distance, there's going to be a certain amount of generality. Those characters are going to kind of be archetypical. Um, you're going to probably have to use, probably have to write from the third person for that one, I would think, maybe. Yeah, but that's a good question. That, that, in fact, that is, a, that is a kind of an issue to think about when you've got a short story. How um, how far can you manage all this stuff in a short amount of time? And it, and it is kind of, if you want to do it justice. Uh, one, one way of thinking about it might be like, if you go to a party and you're having a good time, I don't know about you, but if ever, if ever I'm at a party, there's a big amount of people. And I'm kind of, I never really get to talk to the people that I like. I never really get to, or I don't get to talk to them as long um, as I'd like to. 
I always get kind of, because I'm being trying to be sociable and polite and I'm milling and mixing, I end up having, you know, a half an hour conversation about something I'm not remotely interested in with somebody over there because, and I neglect the most interesting person in the room um, who I haven't seen in ages out of, out of a kind of politeness. So you, you can be torn between um, who you get to spend your attention and time with um, in a story. So if you think a thousand words, that's probably better. That's, that's just like a cup of tea, isn't it? Don't try and have a cup of tea with 20 people. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're not going to learn a lot about them. But if you, if you can have a cup of tea with one person, then, you, then there's probably more you can learn about them. And more that through that interaction, you can, uh, you'll, you'll sort of investigate about human people and, and everything that they do or don't do. OK? Yeah. Any other questions? No? I've, ta I've, I've cracked it. I've I think, yeah. I think you've, you've found your formula for okay. questionless lectures. Well, anyone that does have questions, I'm sure they can put you to me. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, thanks very much for listening. Hope that's been useful. Um, do you want to say anything? No, in closing? no? Okay. Thanks very much. Enjoy the sunshine. Uh, see you later.